I think the the danger in medicine, one of the poisons today is the absolutism that's out there. And when we go through medical school, it's a you're just memorizing and regurgitating and it's this terrible robotic dogmatic is training. it still that way it's still that way you might even think it say it's worse so i was talking this morning to dr will brune who just graduated you met him um buddy of mine i'm working with on the appropriateness work and he just graduated from oklahoma university school of medicine we were talking about all the useless dumb me wrote memorization stuff. He said it was like 50% of his medical education. This bacteria is catalase positive, catalase negative. This is a branch chain bacteria. This is a straight chain. It just, it's mind numbing. Memorizing the names of enzymes, he says, was like 20% of his medical education. What are we doing to these kids? They come to us in medical school bright, creative, altruistic. They want to do good. Social justice is a generational value. And we beat them with the rote memorization of these enzymes and stuff you can look up. We have phones nowadays. You don't have to know the Krebs cycle on demand in the trauma bay. <laughs> <laughs> and we do this to this incredible generation. You, they, we spit them out seven, eight years later. They're different people. They're robotic. They're sometimes emotionally disconnected. They've learned to reflex as a survival mechanism in order to do what we tell them to do, which is get through the exams. And the thing that kills me, and a lot of students, they see the tension, they feel it, they hate it, they're fighting it. And we do have incredible students that are able to stay normal through the process. But it's a struggle because the culture of medicine says obey. And it's one private company that controls the medical education in every medical school in America, the AAMC, a small group of people get to decide what every doctor learns in their medical education. And these people are dinosaurs. They're forcing these kids to memorize the names of all these. And what's the relationship between the AAMC and the company that administers um, the USMLE and the accreditation? Are they, are they linked in some way? Presumably. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, that is the private organization, AAMC. Small group of people. Is the entity that also regulates the USMLE yeah. the licensing exams? Yes. Got it. They collect a lot of money from these students. It's a private organization, and they are – so I know um, – I was talking to a, you know one of the cool things that we get to do is talk to a lot of people out there in America and get a, a bit of a bird's eye view on things. And I was talking to a conference of medical school deans. And later on, I had met the dean of uh, medical school in San Antonio, University of the Incarnate Word, UIW, it's called. Great medical school, San Antonio. And she's like, gosh, Marty, you're so right. Why do we have to teach all this rote memorization and just beat them to regurgitate? I would love, she's told me, to teach self-awareness and understanding uncertainty and focus on applied statistics and the critical appraisal of research and the fact that there are nerves that extend to every aspect of the hand without having to name 50 nerves in the hand, you know, and regurgitate on the exam. I would love to have a modern day education, but I can't because the double AMC dictates what we teach and we have to teach to a test and our test score pass rate. So it's this terrible system and it's it connected to the American Board of Medical Specialties, which issues board certification. And recently they've basically said, in order to keep your board certification, you got to pay us two to three hundred dollars every two years or so and take a quiz that we give you. And um, they're out there like making a ton of money off this new thing. Now they're requiring, they're telling hospitals, you have to require current board certification. And unless they've paid us, we're a private company, they're not currently board certified. Imagine your college, UCSF or no, Berkeley. Where'd you go to college? Again? I went to college in Canada. Okay. Imagine your college called you and said, hey, your degree, <laughs> you don't have it anymore. You got to pay us every year to keep your degree. That's exactly what the American Board of Medical Specialties is doing. They're a private organization. It's a monopoly. My buddy Will was telling me at Oklahoma University School of Medicine, I probably shouldn't say this, but what the heck, eight hours on transgender 
sensitivity training, two hours on nutrition. The two hours on nutrition, he said, were so pathetic, it might have been better to have zero hours. You know, HDL is good. You know, it's like the most basic. And I see this awareness among a generation of doctors and students that they know something is missing. This isn't right to just be memorizing. They're smart people. And that's why you've got a huge number of people, doctors who are learning from you as you learn, talking about evolving your position. You're out there learning, reading, talking to people. People are learning with you and they're hungry for this kind of honesty with where medicine's going. Maybe we should be talking about more uh, chronic diseases differently. Maybe we should be talking more about treating diabetes with cooking classes than just throwing insulin at people. Maybe we should talk about school lunch programs, not just putting kids on Ozempic. Maybe we should talk about sleep medicine when we treat high blood pressure, not just throwing antihypertensives at people, first line, second line, third line. Maybe we should talk about ice and physical therapy instead of just surgery and opioids when somebody comes in with pain. Food is medicine, the microbiome, general body inflammation. These are the topics that a generation of doctors are starving to talk about. We need more research in them. They want to think differently. But who would fund this research, Marty? I mean, I think when I, when I talk about the pillars of, of medicine, right, we have nutrition and exercise and sleep and emotional health and then molecules. So that's roughly five things. And you could really add a sixth pillar, which it would be like a, a sort of a waste bucket, uh, you know, of everything else that may or may not have benefit, like sauna, cold plunge, mm -hmm. you know, red light therapy, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, one of those buckets is really taught well in medical school. We really do learn, and by medical school, I mean medical school and reg re residency, right? So you learn about procedures and medications very well. That's that's what we we learn, and I think we do learn that quite well. Um, but to your point, we learn nothing about exercise, sleep, nutrition, and emotional health and well-being. Um, but part of that, if you're not trying to be, if you're trying to be as uncynical as possible is, at least when it comes to molecules and procedures, the way to study it is straightforward. The interventions are easy. You take this pill or you don't take, you take this pill or you take the placebo. Um, and then on top of that, there's a financial engine that supports the use of that, which justifies the cost of the studies. But when it comes to doing research on many of these other things, you know, outside of philanthropic and government causes, um, such as the NIH, it's very difficult to get any of that research funded. So how, how would we create a new medicine around something for which it would be so difficult to, to really gather the right evidence? Or would you argue, look, we already know enough today that we could teach off the current practice? The NIH could not be more broken. They've got these siloed funding centers, as you suggested. And on, you know, unless your research falls under kidney, you know, cardiovascular disease, and it's what the old belt, belts and suspenders professors there want to fund, it's a legacy system where if the senior guys who've done the research and made a name for themselves on an idea like it, they throw money your way. I think the disruption is happening right now private industry. You're seeing private in industry fund research on different probiotics and bacteria you can introduce. We're seeing private industry fund research. They funded our research on price gouging and predatory billing, another big blind spot in medicine. I do think, you know, a lot of our work is not funded by the NIH. And people come up and say, my gosh, it makes sense what you're saying. Why don't we have a big study on natural immunity? And we could draw the blood of these people. I mean, how many studies have you put out there where you've said, this study needs to be done? It's not what falls in line with the NIH silos, but it needs to be done. The classic example, a practice right now that is surging in the United States is taking a newborn and cutting the frenulum under their tongue, either routinely mm. or if, if it's a foreshortened tongue. Some people believe in routine, and other people believe in only in foreshortened, and other people believe never should be done. I don't know what the truth is. I have good ENT friends. What is the rationale for doing this? The rationale, the claim, is that it'll improve breastfeeding and lactation rates, that it may help, there's claims out there, that it may help with sleep apnea, with speech impediments. Um, I think they're outrageous claims when it goes that far. These are 
people who are also cutting the frenulum under the upper inside lip mm -hmm. and sometimes the side of the tongue and the frenulum under the tongue as all. Yeah. So there's been babies that don't breastfeed because they're in pain from this. And this practice is taking off like crazy. It's driven a lot in dentistry. It's in that lactation world of lactation consultants could refer you to somebody. And it's this dogma that has never had any scientific evidence to support the claim. Now, I'm not saying it's bad. Is it being tested? No. I'm not saying it's bad or wrong, but I'm saying this desperately needs a randomized controlled trial. Desperately. Just like the peanut allergy study, just like the antibiotic study, do it in a cohort of a couple hundred, randomization, follow them, take a look, five years or whatever the study design is needed. Who's going to fund that study? Big Pharma? <laughs> no, fat chance. Um, the NIH? Not one of their clinical centers. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics with their you know $1,000 a year membership of all these... $130 million in revenue they take in a year. No, no, they haven't. Possibly. No, they no interest. This is the Bermuda Triangle of healthcare in the United States and worldwide. We desperately need to fund things where there are ideas, people are doing things, and they're doing them in a black hole with no scientific evidence. We need to do the appropriate study. We could answer the controversy in less than a year. I hate to mention COVID. We saw this during COVID. All those COVID controversies could have been answered in three weeks or a month or two. They could have done the clinical study, immediately done the randomization, answered the question. Instead, they everyone went in, on TV and opined about it. It's easier. The NIH controls $80 billion. What are they funding? They were funding this cruel dog experiment at the University of Iowa trapping these dogs and having these sand flies bite their heads in these cages and concluding in the, in the article that is published, uh, leishmaniasis can spread through, you know, from dog to dog via sand fly bites. Who gives a shit? Okay. It's, it, th this is where our tax dollars are going. And then we're not funding basic clinical research out there. Why do you think that is? I think it's just, I don't think it's diabolical. I think people um, get set in their ways. I think it's Leon Festinger's cognitive dissonance. I think people think, oh, this would be interesting. Find out whether or not, you know, what's the average diameter of stones on Thame Street? That would be interesting. No, it's not interesting. I'm seeing it a lot now with health equity. I think describing disparities in health equity, in my personal opinion, is not interesting at all. We know there are massive disparities in health equity. Saying, oh, well, there's also a health disparity in you know, chronic myelogenous leukemia, according to health. That's not interesting. What's in, we've, that's known. What's interesting is what you're doing to reduce disparities in health equity. And yet half of the papers now, when I go to these conferences, are on you know, differences in so-and-so by you know, race and socioeconomic status. Yeah, it's been known since the beginning of time, the number one driver of health status overall in a population is the socioeconomic status of that community. So I, I think it's just, I don't know, intellectual laziness, the old guard. There are fresh ideas in medicine. But when you show up in medicine, and you've done this, you show up in the academic world as a resident or you get a peek of it as a student, you have big ideas. Hey, this thing about the microbiome and the rates of this and it all fits and maybe chronic diseases have gone up with antibiotics, whatever the big idea is, you're told, no, no, you need to pick one narrow area and work on an incremental little scientific paper that'll go to the abstract of the Southern Surgical Society or whatever it is. And that's how the NIH funds their research, little small ideas. We need big ideas. They don't fund that. We need new ideas on cancer. What's the ROI on our cancer funding? A paper at ASCO showed that Avastin increased uh, glioblastoma sur survival rates by um, two months. Well, patients want to know what's the cure. Did you cure anyone else that you haven't cured before? If that's the top paper at ASCO, our investment on research has a terrible ROI. And I think it's because we're not funding big ideas. We need Ben Franklin thinkers. 
Ben Franklin, intellectually curious, starts thinking about ophthalmology, invents bifocals, is interested in electricity, invents the lightning rod, invents a stove called the Pennsylvania stove, which is an amazing invention. I mean, he's a science, a true scientist. We don't have Ben Franklin thinkers today in medicine. I think Vinay Prasad is one. You I think, think we don't one. have them or you think we don't have a, a vehicle to fund them? We don't have a vehicle to encourage them. I think, and I'm just saying this because I've said this to other people, you're one of those Ben Franklin type thinkers. You think broadly about healthcare. That's what we do on our research team is you're told in med school day one, hey, here's the Netter textbook of anatomy. Pick an organ. You're going to have to f focus on just one. Which one do you like? Do you like kidney? Do you like brain, heart? Just, you have to pick one. You're like, well, what if I'm interested in the whole body or the system or the way we deliver care or the way we fund research or approve drugs? Or what if I'm interested in all of it? What if I'm interested in gun control and violence prevention and I'm interested in trauma and all everything you're basically told no no stop thinking like that you got to pick an organ I mean I went to the gym as a medical student and there were some docs there were also used to the gym and they would ask me every day what are you going into again and I want to be like I'm a second year medical student I don't know is that okay I don't know and I think you can get a, a specialization and then come around and get off the hamster wheel. There's a lot of these docs now saying, I don't care about my RVU bonus. I wanna do something more meaningful. And they're starting businesses. 50% of our medical students at Johns Hopkins are getting a second degree with their medical degree. They, they don't wanna live the life that they see you know, with these guys who are like, I got four NIH grants and presented, you know, I got 60 papers. I mean, I hit that point where I was like, Okay, I've published 300 scientific peer review articles. Nobody's reading them. I don't think I've made beyond maybe a couple meaningful contributions. Like, what are we doing? We've got to focus on impact. So everything we do now in our research group focuses on impact. And that's how we got into the science of medical errors, frailty as a condition, predatory billing and price gouging in medicine. You know, 62% of Americans say in a Harvard survey, they don't trust the medical profession to bill them fairly and they avoid care or delay it for fear of the bill. So you can now have the cure for pancreas cancer, but that cure is only, instead of being 100% effective, it's only 38% effective because you've lost, you've lost that connection, right? So um, rebuilding trust is the hottest topic right now in medical journals, essays. 